start the recording and then share the screen. Um, okay, let me go back. Um, I will very quickly, uh, so unless there are any other, other questions, I will start if you don't mind. Fine. Okay. So uh, yesterday we saw many, <coughs> sorry. Um, yesterday we saw uh, some uh, known uh, techniques for such solving, um, in including probably the, well, some of them are quite out of date. Uh, and the only technique which is actually still used uh, is OBDDs. Uh, actually, the tableau uh, don't be misleading, misled by the fact that many procedures, uh, for instance, for description logic, are called tableau. Yes, uh, they call tableau for historical reasons, but uh, most of they are a, a mixture of a tableau techniques and DPL-like techniques. Okay, so don't be misled by the name. However, I seem to understand that no, nobody of you has nothing to do with the description logic reasoning and uh, so that's not uh, um, relevant for you. Okay, I very quickly, um, today I will very quickly go through, uh, complete uh, the, uh, the survey of other techniques uh, by saying a few words about incomplete such techniques very quickly. And then we go to the main topic of today, which is CDCL such solving. So um, as far as incomplete such techniques, there are, has been some work in particular in AI for some application of AI on incomplete uh, SAT techniques. In particular, <coughs> for um, stochastic local search, also known as uh, hill climbing uh, um, techniques for SAT. They are incomplete techniques in the sense that uh, they are only able to tell if uh, a satisfying assignment if, uh, is available, if there is a model, but they cannot say if there is no satisfying assignment. So, so they are good to find satisfiability, but they are incapable to de decide unsatisfiability. And the work by Wims of greedy search, so the idea of looking for a better neighbor assignment. Um, the, well, I don't know whether you have seen anything like that in, in, alg in the greedy algorithm from a local minima, for um, in the algorithms in general. But the, typ the typical problem is uh, of this kind of, of uh, techniques is uh, getting stuck into local minima. And by doing that, you insert some random component. Okay, just, I go through them very quickly. Um, the first one was the GSAT algorithm. It was proposed in 1992 by Selman and Kautz. And uh, okay, this is very, very simple algorithm. And the idea is that to try to minimize uh, uh, is based on the classic minimize, uh, grade minimization techniques. But the idea is to minimize the number of unsatisfied clauses of four. So if you have a truth assignment, you have uh, a number of clauses which are, uh, and the, the, you have a number of clauses which are made false by this truth assignment, right? If this number is zero, then your formula is satisfied, okay? So the idea is to consider the number of unsatisfied form as a score, so and or also known as energy, and try to decrease this number and uh, optimize this number uh, until uh, you either find a zero or uh, you exhaust the, the amount of the resources that you have uh, that you have uh, pre-selected, that's a time, a number of attempts, and so on and so forth. So the idea of the original algorithm, the GSAT, which is in front of you now, uh, is, uh, um, okay, you, you made a maximum amount of, uh, of max tries, uh, of a uh, maximum amount of tries overall. And at every try, you start from a random assignment. We are, by assignment move here, we mean total truth assignments, okay? And then uh, you do uh, a maximum amount uh, of uh, flips, uh, where flip uh, means uh, toggling the value of uh, one single uh, truth assignment, single assignment to one single variable, okay? 
So you repeat uh, for, uh, anti for a maximum amount of, um, given a maximum amount of flips. At every step, you compute the score of the current proof assignment. So you, you check how many uh, clauses are unsatisfied, okay? And if this is zero, well, of course, you are done. Great, you have found a satisfying assignment, okay? Otherwise, you do what is called the high hill climbing uh, uh, procedure, which means uh, you find uh, the, um, you, you select uh, a list of uh, uh, literals in, uh, in your current assignment, such that flipping that literal, you would give a gain in, in, uh, a gain in uh, the best gain in um, the score, okay? So we'll allow you to improve. So what is the best improvement? So you, you check, uh, if I flip this, this literal, I will have uh, an improve uh, that number of unsatisfied closer instead of the current one. And uh, check uh, and get the list of those which uh, cause the best improvement. Okay, so probably there are many of them which get the best improvement. Notice that the best improvement can be zero. So you can, so you may have sometimes a situation which are called plateaus, in which uh, uh, the curve of the neighbor, neighbor means a substantial distance, hemming distance one. Okay, so only one flip or difference. Okay, you select the set of those which get the best improvement, and this is done by heat climbing procedure. And then you randomly pick among those one choice. And then you flip, you flip it. And then you repeat, repeat, repeat. Well, this surprisingly simple algorithm in the 92s brought uh, quite a very important uh, uh, improvement uh, of, uh, uh, of the um, of performance, in particular in planning problems at the time. Um, why planning? Well, planning are typical problems where uh, you know more or less you know a priori that the, your formula is satisfiable, but the hard part is to find one. Okay, so once you have created the, that formula, of course. Um, now there is one version which is uh, now okay. This was ninety two, in um, if I remember correctly, ninety nine. They came out with Worksat, which is now the leading uh, algorithm in the sense that there are many, many, uh, I forgot to say, of course, not that this is not an algorithm, but a family of algorithms, because they depend a lot on how do you generate the first assignment. You can take it randomly. You can take it uh, by making a, an average of the best results so far. You can, uh, do any possible uh, intermediate situations. Uh, how do you get compute heat climbing? How do you interleave the best flip with some random move? Uh, whatever, you may have plenty of many uh, techniques to variations of uh, that. Similarly, a family of algorithm is the so-called, uh, which is now very popular, is so-called uh, WorkSat family. Worksat uh, is an algorithm again proposed by Salman Account and, and, and uh, plus McAllister. Um, this works, uh, and uh, unlike uh, GSAT, uh, it's uh, uh, targeted to, um, it's targeted uh, uh, explicitly to uh, identify those literal which falsify the current clauses. So again, you have a maximum amount of loops, okay? Again, you may start from a random assignment. Okay, this is one version, then you can have many different heuristics by which you start a new assignment, uh, having an average uh, from the best uh, assignment so far, having a random component, whatever. There are many variations of, of this. Again, you have an internal loop with a maximum amount of score. Okay, and inside each loop, um, well, first of all, okay, you check if uh, you have reached uh, a satisfying assignment. So if your score is zero, if your assignment is zero, of course, you, you're done true. true. Otherwise, and that's the difference with the, the, main, the key difference with respect to GSAT and other algorithms, you target explicitly the um, 
you target explicitly the uh, lead, the clauses which are unsatisfiable. Okay, so get the unsat uh, get the the clauses which were ma made false by the current tooth assignment. Okay, okay, a pick one of those clauses, well, randomly or according to some heuristic. Okay, pick one of those clauses. And uh, according to some heuristic, select one variable among this, inside this clause. Okay, so the idea is not you don't unlike GSAT, you don't uh, look a, as a hill climb, so, but you explicitly target the clauses which are currently unsatisfied. Okay, well, of course, by and then you flip one of those variables. Well, of course, flipping will make that for that clause satisfied, but it may make some other unsatisfied. So, heuristically sex variable, as I said, this algorithm is not an algorithm but a family of algorithms, depending a lot of which heuristic you you use here. And uh, by heuristic, uh, you may use a climbing. So, see, pick the one which uh, makes you the most. Uh, the best improvement, okay? Or interleave this with some random move. All those steps are typically interleaved with a given probability with some random move in order to exit from a local minima, okay? Uh, okay, if uh, after a given amount of resource or timeout or whatever, then you return uh, no, no satisfying assignment. This is uh, the most popular argument that a lot of many variations, lot many variations of this algorithm, with lots of heuristics, lot of interleaved random component, random moves, and so on. But this is the skeleton of may of most uh, stochastic local search algorithms from South. and they have uh, uh, some good success, in particular on random formulae or on um, on problems which are known a priori to be satisfied. Uh, there are many, there are also variations, uh, many variants of that. There are also no CNF variants of those two arguments. Okay. Uh, so, what overall, typically they only handle only CNF formulas. They can also handle no CNF formulas but directly, but these algorithms are, not, uh, are never been seriously implemented. Um, they, are they are incomplete. They are efficient for some problem. They turn out to be very efficient. So sometimes there are uh, they are used in a portfolio fashion with other such solvers. So running parallel uh, on on uh, with other uh, complete such solver. They require polynomial space because all you need is keeping track of your current assignment. And they are mostly proposed uh, in artificial intelligence. Okay. Uh, if you have ever attended the course of uh, Professor Holger Hus, who used to give some courses here at university a couple of years ago, he is a big expert on this on those topics. One of the world's world leader on uh, on this, and you have some no CNF uh, variants on that one, uh, actually by myself, and uh, uh, but that's more or less it. So unless you have any question, so do we have any question about uh, those techniques? Okay, I, I can point you to many uh, uh, literature uh, if you are interested. Because after that, I really want to go to the main topic of this class, uh, and mostly uh, probably the, the main topic uh, of, of the first part of the course, which is CDCL subsolvers, how a modern subsolver works. Okay, so uh, the, the main idea was DPLL. Okay, so the grandfather was uh, DPLL, but it was augmented by many new ideas, in particular since 1996. Uh, in particular, the key uh, main idea was back jumping and learning. In fact, uh, CDCL means uh, um, close conflict directed close learning. They have some smart form of preprocessing, also in processing. They depend on restarting a branching heuristic. They have restarts. They have 
plenty many techniques, but the leading one is big jumping LLM, in which I will insist a lot on this class. Okay, the main key point to understand is the following. So DPLL is based on what is called chronological backtracking or classic backtracking. So substantially, the point is every time you branch, you select one literal, so select some one variable, uh, select the truth value of that variable and go ahead. So this causes you a branch. And then when, if you are not able to find any truth assignment after that decision, you backtrack and you undo that choice and, uh, and uh, do the opposite and try, and try the opposite. So it means you assigned a, a3 to true, this fails, then you undo that and you assign a3 to false. Okay, if you go back to the DPLL algorithm. Um, well, we have presented the DPLL algorithm as a recursive algorithm, but in practice, this is uh, implemented as a stack. So whoever has, a, so you, you should know that typical, uh, every recursive algorithm can be implemented uh, in an iterative way by using a stack, okay? Well, not surprisingly, the implementation of the algorithm of a recursion is based on the stack of your machine, right? Okay, so the idea, the, the, the actual implementation of the PLL is based on a stack. So truth assignment is a stack in which every literal is uh, labeled as unipropagated, if this was assigned there by unipropagation, or open, if it was uh, the result as a decision, or closed, if it's the result of it was formally decided, then you backtrack and then you choose the right branch. Okay? So, substantial, this means uh, a left branch. So, this means unipropagated. This means a left branch. This means a right branch. Okay? So, substantially, the, the idea is that when a conflict is encountered, the stack is popped up to the most recent open assignment. Okay, so when the last the you the, the current branch uh, falsifies a one close, you pop pop you backtrack meaning you pop from the stack the literals until you pop you get into the a literal which was a decision and was a left so the the first decision so you pop it and we you toggle its value and go ahead. You decide his, you label this as closed, of course, and then go ahead. Okay, is this clear so far? This is nothing else than uh, uh, an iterative version of the DPLL algorithm we have seen yesterday. Okay, so unfortunately, this has some drawback. So in 1995, um, uh, uh, Sylvain Sakala realized that this, there was something wrong. In that. And uh, in order to understand this, I will show you by an example. Okay, consider, imagine you have a huge formula. So hundreds of thousands or millions of clauses and variables. Okay, so many, many ones. And assume that these nine clauses are a tiny piece of that, fo of that formula. Okay. Now, Suppose at the given point of, the, of your search, you have assigned some of those literals, okay? So suppose you have assigned a nine to false, a 10 to false, a 11 to false, a, a 12 uh, uh, to true, a 13 to true, okay? Notice that in between you may have uh, other assignment on other variables uh, in the forum which are not there. Okay. Okay. Now you may not realize that, and and also the solver does not realize that these nine clauses after this assignment. So after having removed those literals, remember by uh, you uh, unit uh, uh, unit resolution so by unit propagation. Those are so those are dropped from here, right? You may not realize that those non-closers are unsatisfiable. 
Okay, well, we see that, but those nine clauses are unsatisfiable, but the, the SAT solver does not realize that. So notice that those nine clauses can be scattered around also in, in the much bigger formula, okay? So you, you, don't, you, don't, you have no way of realizing that these nine clauses after this assignment are unsatisfiable, okay? Okay, suppose now you do a lot of search on other variables, blah, 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 blah on many other parts of the, of the formula, until you at last make the right decision, by luck, by heuristic, by whatever. So you assign A1 to true, okay? Okay, by assigning A1 to true, well, these two clauses are made true, and uh, those two clauses here become uh, unit. Okay, so you unipropagate them. You apply unipropagation, and uh, by by assigning a two and a three to true. Okay, you make a four unit. This clause unit. Please interrupt me if there is anything you don't understand, please, okay? I assume everything is clear so far, right? Yes. Okay, cool. Now you have A4 is a unit, so you apply again A4, you propagate A4, but this makes these two clauses here unit, okay? You add the unit A1, A2, A3, A4, but now A5 and 6 are unit Okay, a fire six now uh, now are a unit, so we unipropagate that. But haha, down we make this formula fail. Okay, because we we have this clause which is falsified. Right now, what happens? Now we backtrack. So what is the most, the most recent open decision is a one, okay? So we pop all those decisions, okay? We pop a one, uh, oh, sorry. We pop all those decisions and we assign a one to the opposite decision, which labeled this as closed, okay? And go ahead. Now you have assigned it not a one. This means that not a one, those two clauses are true, but now these two clauses here are unit. And by making the unit, a unit propagate them, and this makes this clause false. Okay? Now I want you to make one point. This was done after a long possible set of decision branching, uh, backtrackings, uh, whatever here, okay? But let's go back. What we have seen here is that this formula is unsatisfiable. Why? Because both with A1 to true, assigning A1 to true, and, and uh, assigning A1 to false leads you to an inconsistency, okay? So this means that these nine clauses are satisfied and then satisfiable. Okay. Do you agree on that? Okay, but unfortunately, what happens now if I do chronological backtracking? I don't realize that this is due to these nine clauses. Okay. So I will backtrack to the most recent branching point. I I have no idea how how hundreds or thousands or hundreds of thousands of decisions I've taken in between from here to here. Okay, so we backtrack here, then go other search, another search, another search, another search, another search. And all this search is bound to fail. Why? Because here, after the, I assigned the AA13, this formula is unsatisfiable due to these nine clauses. So all those you possibly huge amount of search here is bound to fail. 
okay? But I don't realize, chronological bit tracking has no way of realizing that. Is, it, is everything clear? Yeah, just a question. Yeah. Um, in that uh, dashed line. Uh, uh, can I ask you a favor in general? When you ask questions, can, only, can you also switch on your uh, camera? I just want to see you. Uh, my camera is on. I'm Elia. Ah, Elia, hi. Ah, okay. Ciao, ah. Elia. See, okay. Okay. Uh, in the dashed line, uh, you draw between A13 and the yeah. choice of A1. Uh, you made decision on variables that are not in between A1 and A13, right? See, yeah, yeah. Remember that here, you, this is only a tiny picture, part of a possibly much, much, much bigger formula. Okay, so the, the, that decisions that are in between A13 and A1 are not uh, included in this picture, right? Yeah, are okay. somewhere, somewhere below here. Okay, thanks. Okay, please switch off your mic because you are the source of the problem. <laughs> Very nasty noise. Okay. Okay. Is it clear now? Okay, fantastic. So here's the problem. So you have, may sorry, have sorry. Uh, so at that time you were already bound to find to file because this was already unsatisfied, but you don't realize it. And when we are here, you go back to do other branches, branch, branch, branch. So you may generate a big sub tree, a big huge search tree here many search trees because simply you don't you did until you undo a13 only undoing a13 you can assure some progress and that's very bad okay this was uh, understood the most well let's say that it was understood in 1995 well there were some people who realized something similar before but uh, Okay, so the, the main key idea was in 1995 by uh, uh, Silva, uh, Silva Sakala. Okay. So, which, who invented uh, conflict-driven closed learning techniques exactly to address this problem? Well, it may be just for historical reasons. Uh, you can discuss whether uh, Sakal and Silva were the real inventors because there were some ideas, preliminary ideas on that also before, but they were the real guys who did and proposed a solution which were really a ch game changer in, uh, in some sort. Okay, what is the intuition, uh, okay, uh, by, by that? So, since as a solve an evolution of the PLL, so they are based on the same idea. So assign truth values to uh, to Boolean atom, backtrack, uh, uh, unit propagate. Uh, again, they use uh, uh, their known recursive, so they use a stack-based representation. But what is most important, they perform a conflict-driven backtracking, also known as backjumping. And learning. So backjumping and learning are the keywords of understanding uh, such solvers, modern such solvers. There are many other in very interesting techniques, uh, also very efficient uh, data structures like the two watch literal scheme and, and others. But the real game changer was big jumping and learning. And also search restart and blah, blah. Now, currently, uh, such solver can solve uh, problems in the order of uh, 10 million Boolean variables and up to 10 million and even 100 million clauses in some particular cases. So this is really impressive. Okay, in order to understand this, I, I just uh, um, have to introduce you how to represent the truth assignment and the notion of decision level and decision levels. Okay. The, Truth assignment, the data structure to, to keep track of the truth assignment in a certain modern sub solver works as follows. It's a stack, right? You know what a stack is. Well, stack going uh, downwards, okay? Expanding downwards in this case. You assigned every liter at the time. The key point of this is that the stack is partitioned into decision levels. Apart from the decision level zero, Every decision layer is given by one decision literal and the 
the, the unit propagated literal which follows after the decision literal. Possibly empty, possibly non. Okay. So typically, what happens in the DPLL, as we have seen before, is that you, assign, you, you make a decision. As a consequence of, the, of that decision, uh, some clause become unit. And so you have a chain of unit propagation. Remember that when you unit propagate one variable, you may cause other clauses to become unit. So you have typically a chain of unit propagation. OK? So typical decision, chain of unit propagation, decision, chain of unit propagation, decision, chain of unit propagation. OK? Well, one example is this, right? You have this decision and then a chain of unit propagations. OK? Uh, OK. Uh, well, of course, there is a decision level. And you count those levels, first from 0 to 1, 2, 3. 1 is the first decision, 2 is the first, second decision. There is, of course, a decision level 0, because it may be the case uh, that uh, initially, you, when you have a formula, maybe the input formula has uh, some uh, units on board start so you have a run of unit propagation before starting uh, doing uh, decisions right well if you think in case of cnf uh, the basic case of cnfization at the end of the day you add one variable representing the the global formula and then uh, all decision well you have to unit propagate that one variable right okay so initially you may you may or you may not have uh, a run of unit propagation up front. And then the search really starts with the first decision, unit propagation, first, second decision, unit propagation, blah, blah. Then, of course, you pop and push, pop and push, pop and push. But then your current snapshot, your current truth assignment has this structure. OK? One important factor is that you keep the following information. You keep uh, the index of the decision level. So every you know for every variable, for every literal here, what is the number, what is the dec it's decision level. These are decision level one, these are decision level two, these are decision level three, and so on. And you keep track, you label every decision in the stack with the close, with the index of the close or a pointer to a close, which caused its unit propagation. Okay? So Decision literal uh, not A56 uh, was uh, uh, assigned here uh, due to unit propagation on close uh, C345. OK? Are we there? No, I think it's right. OK? OK, so this is the data structure we keep. So in every single moment of, uh, uh, of uh, this algorithm, we, we have a data structure keeping track of the status of the search, which is exactly this, OK? Well, in order to understand better this, to understand what's going on, we notice that this can be represented in a graph, which is called implication graph, which is important to understand many things in SAT. So I, I, I explain what an implication graph is. Implication graph is a DAG, directly like psychic graph, such that each node represents a, vari a variable assignment, so a literal, representing the assignment of a variable. Again, positive literal means the variable is assigned to true, negative literal means the variable is assigned to false. OK? OK, every edge of the graph is labeled with a close, OK, causing this. Well, substantially, this mean, every edge means an implication, but labeled on a close. OK. The, uh, when the literal was assigned by all, when and only when the decision was assigned by decision, then uh, the node has no incoming edge. A source edge is a decision. OK. I'll just do show. And all edges in coming into a node L, OK, so if it's a decision, it has no incoming arcs. If it was not a decision, so it was a unit propagated, all the, the edges in coming into the node L are labeled 
with the same clause, and it's the clause which caused the unipropagation of that literal. Okay, so for instance, all the so if you have L, if you have uh, that uh, L uh, has an incoming edge from L1, L2, L3, and then L, all those incoming edges are labeled with the clause which caused them to cause the implication. And the clause will be, of course, given by L and the negation of the other literal. What does it mean? It means that you add that clause here, okay? You had previously assigned L1 to true, L2 to true, L3 to four, Ln to true, okay? And this has caused L to be unipropagated. Okay? This is what happens, okay? So when, if L was unipropagated, then this means that you had assigned to force the previous literals, okay? Um, okay, C is caused, so the, the clause which caused the, your literal to be uh, unipropagated is called the antecedent clause of L. I will show you an example in the next slide, but when both L and not L occur in the graph, then you have a conflict. Right? Remember, the graph represents the current status of the search, okay? And so the, the current truth assignment. And if uh, by some reason you have uh, assigned L to true or false, this means an inconsistency. So you have created an inconsistent state, okay? And so you have a conflict. Okay, so substantially, this keeps track of all the dependency between uh, uh, all the literals in the current of assignment. Okay, so remember the nodes, uh, uh, every node, the, 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 the implication graph represents all and all the nodes, uh, uh, the literals in the current uh, of assignment. The, the graph contains a sequence of literal L1 to L, Ln to L. If L has been obtained from L1 to Ln by unipropagation on the closed C. Okay. Now, the interesting part of this is that if you take a partition of the graph with all decision literal on one side and the conflict on the other side, this represents a conflict set. So, suppose you, have, you get a status when the other search where you have a conflict. Okay, then every such partition represents a conflict set. Okay, let me give you an example. Uh, remember this situation here, right? So we have taken those decisions plus something else, and then you have assigned a one, and then you have unipropagated a two and a three over close C2 and C1, C2. Uh, then a four over close C3, and um, then a five and a six or close C4 and C5, and getting a conflict on close C6. Okay, so here is the status of your of your uh, um, current of assignment, and here is the implication graph. So those suppose suppose those are decisions, right? Well, of course, maybe there are other uh, outcoming arts here. We, you consider only the part of the graph of interest for us. So this is not the whole graph. This is just a tiny part of that, the part of interest for us, okay? So those are supposed decisions. And then you take the key decision of A1. Well, note that A2 is unipropagated on AC on C1 after, after C1. A1 is assigned, okay? Do you see this? So A2 was, is part of the current state because it was unipropagated, was a consequence of A1 over close C1, okay? A3 was unipropagated after A9 and A1 over close C2. You see? Okay. C2 over. Uh, 
Now, A4 was unit propagated on clause C3 after A2 and A3 were assigned. Okay. A5 was unit propagated on clause C4 after A10 and uh, A4 were, uh, sorry, not A10 and A4 were assigned. Finally, A6, A6 was uh, uh, unit propagated on clause C5 after A4 and not A11 were assigned. Well, not 11 was assigned much earlier, okay? But then, then this was assigned. And then we are on C6, we have a conflict. Oh, here you may <coughs> decide, you have a conflict here, okay? Now, what happens? A, conf a conflict set is everything, every cut of this graph, every partition of this graph. So draw a line such as that. The conflict of, on, is on one side of your line and uh, the all decisions are on the, on the other side, okay? And uh, okay, notice for you, consider this very cut. You have one, uh, the conflict on the right and the decision on the left. And uh, consider the nodes by which this involved, right? This involves A5 and A6. Well, indeed, this is a conflict set because if you assign if you assign a5 and a6, sorry, uh, on the original formula, if you assign a5 to true and a6 on the original formula, you make this formula false, right? But every cut, if you check every cut, if you get, if you get all the nodes coming from uh, the incoming guards to the cut, for instance, consider this cut here. You have not A10, A2, A3, not A11. Okay. Well, if you consider this, or, or better, this is a better one. You have not A10, A4, not A11. If you have A4, okay. Um, A4, not A10, where is uh, A4, not uh, A10, okay, and not A11, then you have A5 and A6, but by unit propagation, you get false. So, substantially, if you get the literals coming, which are the source of the incoming uh, arcs of every cut, uh, and you assign them from the original formula, then by unit propagation, you would have uh, obtained a failure on the way on, on this clause. Take the original formula again, assign non a tame, assign a4, and assign not 11. By unit propagation, you obtain the failure of this clause. So the set, every cut here you get is a possible as a conflict set, meaning look, those literal containing this conflict set are enough to call to cause by unit propagation the very same conflict. So are a reason or one possible reason of the same conflict. Of course, there are useful reasons and less useful reasons. But the idea is to identify such reasons. And typically, those cuts are a tiny subset of uh, the uh, of the um, uh, of the assigned literals. Okay. So how another important concept is the what is called a unique implication point. A node is an implicate in an implication graph is a unique implication point, UAP, 
for the last decision level, if every path through the last, starting from the last decision level to the conflict, passes through the literal L. Look here. Every path starting from the last decision to the conflict passes to a unique implication point. So who is an implication point? This is not because you have another path passing through. This is a unique implication point, right? Because all paths starting from the from the last, last decision to the conflict passes through A4. So A4 is a unique implication point. A1 is a unique implication point, of course. So the decision level itself is, is the decision literal, last decision literal itself is a unique implication point, always. So, the, uh, in fact, this is called the last UAP. But then you can have other URPs. For instance, A4 is another URP. Okay? Unique implication point. So all paths pass through here. Let me give you the intuition of uh, the what an UAP is. A UAP is uh, one literal, one literal choice, so an assignment to a one variable such that if you had decided that literal instead of uh, the actual decision, you would have obtained the very same effect. So consider the case here. Uh, okay. So if uh, from here you would have assigned A4, directly A4 instead of A1, you would have uh, unipropagation, uh, a five and a six directly, and then cause the same conflict on the same uh, clause. Okay. So you a UAP, the intuition of UAP is another literal which was unipropagated. Okay, but if I had decided it instead of the last decision literal, I would have obtained the same the same problem. Do you see this? Do you see? Guys? You yeah. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Yes. Yeah. okay, cool. Okay, so this tells you, well, the analysis of this of the conf of those conflicts is actually what drives you in a smart big jump. And I give you the general picture, the general algorithm of uh, a modern CDS solver. Well, initially you pre-process the formula. We see smart thing that we can do in pre-processing and this very much depends on the problems. Okay, we have a general loop. <coughs> okay, so you repeat uh, several times until you, you, you break. Then in the internal loop, what you do is uh, Try to deduce at every step, try to deduce all literals that you can. So substantially apply unit propagations. Okay. At every situation, current, so currently you have uh, uh, your current status of the formula and the current truth assignment. Try to apply as many unit propagations as, as you can. In more than such solver, there are also, they also sometimes do something more than unit propagate, but that's because we consider all unit propagations. Okay. So if, uh, this, if you have reached satisfiability, that is if uh, substantially you have assigned all the variables and you have found no conflict, then you can return that the formula is satisfiable. Great, we are done, okay? Otherwise, and that's the interesting part, if the status is conflict, so we have violated one clause, so we have made some clause false, then we do something magic. So this is the really ma the, this is the real piece of magic of, of modern soft solvers, which is analyze conflict, what is called conflict analysis. By conflict analysis, we return, we see how a reason for the the reason for the one possible reason for the failure, okay, which is typically much, much smaller than the current of assignment. 
So the, the intuition is the following. In general, when you, you violate the clause, only a tiny part of the actual uh, decisions or unit propagation that you've performed really had a role in, uh, in falsifying this clause, okay? So the intuition of uh, this magic step, which we are going to describe in a few minutes, is that it returns a, a strict sub, a typically much smaller subset of new, of the current of assignment, which, uh, which has the following feature. This, uh, uh, the decisions or the this truth assignment would have caused by unit propagation a failure on the same clause if only I had started with eta. So eta is such that if I came back to the beginning and assigned all the literals in the side, for instance, all the literals in eta, then by unit propagation, so that is deterministically, I would have, I would cause a, a failure of exactly on the same clause. Okay, so I don't explain how, so this is what it returns. So this is the what. I will show you the how in the next slide, okay? But it's very important that you understand so the, the what. Uh, so eta is the, 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 the UIP that you discussed in the previous slide. Uh, this is related to the UIP, okay? Okay. Uh, the, we see that eta will contain for sure uh, an, an UIP, okay? This is related, okay. uh, but you have to understand what's the, the main global idea here, the, the, the big picture. This magic device here returns a subset, a typically much, much smaller subset of the current root assignment such that if I assigned only the literals in eta, I obtain the very same conflict by unipropagation. Substantially, you can think that as the subset of wrong decisions that you have made. Okay. And B level is then? No, no, wait, wait a moment. Okay. Okay, sorry, sorry. Uh, I, I will get to the B level, but it's important you understand what the eta is. Okay. Is it clear? It is to me, uh, yes, so far it is. Okay, good. B level is the level, so the, the analysis does two things. First, it identifies this sub-conflict set, and then gives, tells you, according to some criterion, which may vary depending on the, the, the various strategies you do, the level where you have to backtrack. So based on ETA tells you which level you have to backtrack. Remember, backtrack means popping all the literals at the, at the level greater or equal than B level. Okay, so it tells, look, you have this conflict set and, and, and then you have to backtrack at, the, at that level. As I say, I haven't explained what, how this works yet, okay? I'm explaining the global algorithm. So suppose by magic, you have this technique which tells you, look, this is, I've looked at what you have done so far. This is where you got it wrong. This is the list of wrong decisions or wrong assignments, that a subset of or wrong assignments that you have done, which led you to the failure. And go back to this point of the search. Okay. Okay, guys. Sure. Okay. 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 Yes. Now, okay. A, it is a conflict set. Mm -hmm. Well, if B level is zero, then you have you means that uh, you you are done. So this means that below that, so all uh, 
some way you have done some wrong decision at, at level zero, but since level zero, you had no decision, you had no chance. So you could not be zero when forced, old forced assignments, okay? So if you jump to level zero, means that you, you couldn't do anything better. So there's something, there's nothing that you can change and you are bound to fail. So this means that your formula is unsatisfiable. Okay. If B level is zero, then you return on SAT, you are done. Formula is unsatisfiable. If this is not the case, so if B level is not zero, then you backtrack to that B level, to that level. Okay. So you pop, 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 pop until that level, and then you go ahead. Okay. Of course, if it wasn't SAT, it wasn't conflict, then you break and then you uh, and uh, you uh, you break from the loop and then you decide the next branch. So decide the next uh, taking a, So you have exhausted. Uh, you have created a new decision level, and so you have to create a new decision level. So you decide make one decision after which will again you create a, a unit. Blah 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 blah. Okay. So is the global picture clear, provided that uh, we don't know yet how this work? Yes. Okay. So the use is chain of unit propagations. Okay. Decide is some heuristic by which you pick a variable and you decide a, a truth value to assign to it. Okay. So the only open issue is what this procedure does. Okay which is the key idea of uh, CDCL. Okay, so this is exactly what uh, I have uh, explained to you. Okay, now let's see this point here. Okay, you have done what happens. So you have, uh, remember what you have done here. You have done all those decisions here, right? Then after a big amount of search, useless search, you have assigned a one. Then by unit propagation, you have unit propagation at two and three over C, C1 and C2. Then by unit propagation, you have generated a four, which is a unique implication point. Then you have generate, you unit propagate a five and a six, and this causes you a conflict. Okay, so far. Now you have to understand when, what's wrong with that, and where you should backtrack. Okay? Okay? So remember, yeah. the technique, standard techniques, okay, you pop up to here, you, you decide uh, uh, not a one, go ahead. Let's see what instead we can do. And here, there are more than one techniques. So the general idea of a big jumping you're learning is that when a branch fails, which is actually this case, okay, you reveal the sub assignment eta, which causes the failure. Then what you do, so remember one important fact, eta is such that if I decide all the elements, if I had decided all the elements in eta from the beginning, this would have caused me by unit propagation a failure on the very same clause, right? Okay, once you, I have found by magic this eta, I negate it, okay? I write a clause which is definition as the negation of this eta. Remember that eta is a conjunction of literals, which means that C is a disjunction of literals, okay? Well, the negation of conjunction is uh, the conjunction of, uh, of the, sorry, the negation of the conjunction is the disjunction of the negations, okay? And then you use eta to decide the point where to backtrack, which uh, may cause you a jump, which is much, 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 much higher than the one, than to the most recent branching point. Okay? And which allows you to avoid redundant search. Okay. This is the global picture. 
then of course there is no not one single strategy to do this there are tens of strategies okay have been proposed in the literature i will tell you two the first one the first will the one who was proposed by sakala and silva and uh, what is considered my the leading one which is the first uip so the one uh, which most solvers use currently okay May i use i describe them both because uh, uh, in order to understand this uh, i think it's better to understand this first okay okay let's see what does generically mean conflict analysis Conflict analysis is try to identify a set of literal by getting by undoing unipropagations. Remember, unipropagation are deterministic steps. So once you decide something, then by deterministic step, unipropagation, you get some other uh, conflicts. So some way, deterministic steps are not relevant. Okay. So what caused you wrong is the, de the decision or something similar to a decision you took, right? The rest came by unipropagation. So it's like, so if imagine that you have uh, reached the, uh, you are driving and you have reached the wrong place. You reached the dead end, okay? And then you are trying to, to get back to find the right way, okay? One stupid thing that you can do is go back to uh, to the most recent fork, take the other direction, and then maybe you end you end again. Go back to the uh, to the most recent fork, to the second most recent fork, and so on. Right? Which should be very bad, very stupid to do. Right? Instead, you can look to the map or look around and try to figure out what was the wrong the decision, the critical decision you got it wrong in the past which made you going in the wrong and go back to that fork. Okay. And do the opposite direction, of course. Right. Okay. So what you do and in doing that, you don't consider, you consider only forks, not the pieces of road that you were forced to do anyway. Right. So what you do, you undo, Unit propagations in a driven way. So the, the, the idea is that you start from uh, the falsified clause, which is also called the conflicting clause. So the the, the clause you may uh, you made false, the current proof assignment made false, and then you repeat the following process. You take the current clause at every step. You take the current clause, and you resolve. You check it, you check the current clause and look what was this most recently unipropagated literal in L. Okay. And then you resolve it, so you do resolution against the antecedent clause. So the cause which caused the unipropagation of that literal. And this way you obtain the new the new clause. In doing that, so you do this until C, your final C, verifies some criterion. And there are different criteria by which you can, you, you can do this. Let me give you an example. Okay, think of what your intuition suggests you. So the, the first intuition that you have is that you consider only decisions. All the rest is deterministic, right? So what you do, you undo backwards all the unit propagation until your you have a clause which contains only decisions. This was indeed the, the very very first idea that people had, uh, uh, Sakala and Silva had. Okay, okay. Look at here. Uh, if you look at the the formula here, so the failure is not done on not a five. Uh, or a not a six, okay? And this was caused by unit propagation on C4 and C5 on those two clauses here, okay? 
and then uh, a four was unit population on C3 and so forth. Okay. So you look at this clause here. Who is the most recently assigned literal here? Well, okay, first of all, does this contain a unipropagated literal? Yes. So we have to do something. Who is the most recently assigned unipropagated literal? A6. Well, not A6. Okay. So take the antecedent clause of A6. Remember, in the stack, you keep track of the antecedent clause of every literal, unipropagated literal. Take its antecedent clause and resolve it. Apply a resolution which will eliminate A6. And then you add this clause here, which we have entered a new decision. Now we have two unipropagated literal, which are A4 and A5. Who is the most recent unipropagated literal? A5, not A5, right? Where was it assigned? So, well, the most unipropagated literal was A5, okay? So, who, who is the antecedent clause? This clause here, which is, I don't remember, C3 or C4. I resolve with this. I obtain this clause here. Now, I have only one literal on board, only one unipropagated literal. I mark here blue literal, this uh, unipropagated literal, and read uh, the decisions, okay? Now, I have still one unipropagated literal, a four. So I, I resolve with the intestine clause as a four, and I've obtained a three and a two. Again, what is the most recent? A three. I resolve with the antecedent of a three, and I've obtained a one and not a four. A, a, not a one, a two. I have not a two. And uh, sorry, uh, here I, I, I got it wrong. Blue are not only unipropagated. Blue are the one belong to the last decision level. Okay. Um, here, I uni okay, I uh, uni uh, I resolve with the antecedent of A2, of not A2, okay. Okay, and I obtain not a one. Ha ha. Now, all the formula, all the clause I have, contains only decision literals, the negation of all only decision literal. Notice what I've done backward, A6, A5, A4, A3, A2. So I have undone exactly those unit propagations. Okay, and I tell you now I have one. One first criterion is contain all decisions. So substantially, a one, not a nine, not a ten, and a eleven are one set of wrong decision I took. If I go back to the original formula, if I take those four decisions by unit propagation, I obtain a failure on exactly the same clause. You can check it. Okay. Okay, so far. Yeah. Yes. Cool. Now. Okay. A slight variant on that. is what is called the last UAP strategy, which appears to be identical, but there's a slight difference. Uh, you do, um, uh, you, uh, you stop when uh, the, the final clause contains only one literal assigned at the current decision level. Notice that all, only A1 is, occurs um, at the, uh, um, was assigned at the last decision level, right? This is the last decision level. Well, what's the difference with the previous one? Um, in this example, they are the same. 
in general, if uh, it may be the case that some of those guys here are not decisions, but they, for instance, A10 here may come as a unit for something else, okay? If this is the case, uh, the decision literal would further resolve A10 back until it gets the set of decisions which led to A10, okay? The last UAP instead just stops after you have done everything you needed at the last decision level. Okay, so this is the second criterion. One further uh, criterion, which is simpler, is the first UAP criterion and says, look, uh, uh, okay, sorry, the last one, Antici contains only, uh, contains only one liter. Sorry, um, the, the previous one was, until C contains only the last decision, only one literal assigned to the uh, current decision layer, and that must be the last UAP, so the, the, the current decision layer, okay? So until uh, the only literal assigned at the current decision level is the last UAP, okay? Instead, the first UAP criterion is simpler, and uh, uh, um, stops when the current, the, the clause that you have generated, the conflict set you have generated, um, contains only one literal assigned at the current decision level, regardless the fact that this is the last decision or not. Okay? Are we there? Yes. 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 Okay. <clears throat> um, the intuition of this is that you pretend that A4 was the, your decision. Remember that I saw, well, if uh, A4 is in a UAP, okay? Notice that when this happens, this can only happen I, when either the remaining, the such a literal is the last decision or that such a literal is a UAP, right? And in particular is the first, it was called the first UAP. So the first one you encounter back one. In our case, A4. So what we have done, um, let me go, let me show you. By doing this step, we start from this conflict here, which is done on conflict set A5 and A6, and we progressively include some literals. So we pass from this conflict here, then we get to this conflict here. You can check on the resolution that this is actually what we are doing. And then we, we enlarge with this cut. So we start including progressively literals in the cut. For instance, the first UAP we stop here when we have not A11, A4, not A10. Okay, not A11. Remember that the complex set is the negation of the clause, right? Not A11, not A10, A4. Okay, we go backward in the cut. Progressively including any, any step any new literal. Okay, so this is the, the cut corresponding to the first UAP close. This is the cut corresponding to the last UAP close. Okay. Okay, so far. Substantia, you undo, by doing that, you undo unipropagations, you see? You do unipropagation at the last decision level. Okay, what happens now? Notice that the clause that you have learned 
is such. The original formula entails it. Why? Remember that C is the negation of the conflict site. And the conflict site is such that the formula and the conflict site causes you a failure, so entails false. So if phi and uh, eta entails false, means that uh, phi entails not eta. Okay, this is clear. Okay. Yes. Okay, just basic step of in Boolean logic. Okay. Okay, so that's very important. Phi entails so all those clauses that we learn. All those clauses in this chain here are clauses which are entailed by the original formula. This obviously this is right. Well, you can also see in this way. This is an original clause. This is an original clause. So you deduce this clause by uh, by ori clause about the uh, original clause. Not this. All are original clauses. So this is a deduction of a clause from original clauses, right? So all this are entailed, right? Okay. So this clause is entailed, but also also this clause is entailed. Also the so all clauses entailed by this process are entailed by the original formula. Okay, is a deduction, is a resolution deduction. Okay. So okay, so this means that if you add this clause. To the original formula, you change nothing. You don't change it. So you can safely add this clause to the original formula, right? Why? Because it doesn't change the validity. So if you take a formula which is entailed by the formula, you can safely add it without changing its models, right? Okay, this is basic Boolean logic. Okay, so this is important. Uh, notice again that uh, finding C is equivalent again to find a partition of this graph. Okay. Okay, now what you do? Again, what can you do with that? Depends on the strategy that you may want to implement. The first idea by uh, Sakala and, um, and Silva was to uh, do the following. So find the conflict set by generating, uh, uh, by using the decision criterion. So the conflict set used by the decision criterion. Okay. Add the close to the close set temporarily, either temporarily or permanently, or backtrack to the most recent branching point such that the stack does not fully contain eta. And then you propagate the unassigned literal on C. Okay, so learn eta by, so learn the set of decisions which by undoing, by undoing the, um, the unit propagations. Learn the decisions which led you to the conflict by unit propagation. Okay. This is called conflict clause. So negate it, add a clause, and say, add this clause saying, look, you should not do at least one of those decisions. Okay. You should avoid doing at least one of those decisions. Okay. And then you backtrack to the most recent branching point. Okay which allows you to not, which do not contain such a, one such decision. Okay, so in doing this, okay, you learn, so the, the conflict here by unit propagation, see the, the decision uh, uh, strategy, or also the last UAP strategy. You have 
not a ten. Um, you have uh, the clo the conflict set, not a nine, and not uh, a ten, not a eleven, and a one, which correspond to the clause a nine, a ten, eleven, and not a one. Okay, so you learn this clause, you add this clause to the conflict set. Okay. You add it, and you undo until there is at least one literal, which is not until you undo the failure, right? So, what you do, you undo the last decision, and then now this is a unit and unit propagate. Well, you may think, guys, but I have obtained exactly what I, I was with chronological tracking. That's not a good idea. No. Indeed, currently you have obtained exactly what you, you had. Okay. So you had uh, you have undone a one. But there's a huge difference. This one is not the right branch. This is a unit propagation on this clause, which will play a role in conflict analysis in the next branch. Now, this A1 is no more a right decision. Is as if you had the unit propagated it. Okay. You pretend that you had known this clause from the beginning, and you pretend that you had unipropagated it. So yes, you, you unipropagate a seven and a eight and got a conflict, yeah? And having a conflict, applying the same uh, technique, check it well. I give you as exercise to, to check, to, to, to do, you obtain this clause here this time okay do this by exercise okay the solution but now what you do is you apply now what is the most recent decision contained here not a3 not a13 haha <laughs> you jump to the most recent decision involved in the conflict set. And now, so you have done exactly the same thing that you have done before, but now, sorry, you don't jump to the most recent decision here, but you are, have been able to identify that A13 was the last best decision you made. Okay, so overall, you were able to identify that those five guys here were the bad guys. And so everything, so is going here is worthless. You should undo one of those guys, well, the most recent one. Okay. Right? You should undo A13. Okay, guys, is this clear? Yes. Yes. You see the, the big power of that. So in a, compared with the chronological best tracking, here you may have a hundred thousand of uh, decisions in which you may cause you blah, blah, blah. Here you have done this piece of uh, decision was very, very similar with only one tiny difference. The tiny difference was that not, this not as one was not the, um, the right of the, uh, the, uh, the clause, the second uh, value of the decision, but was a unit propagation, which becomes part of the unit propagation, which uh, of, of the conflict analysis you do here. And the conflict analysis you do here, you are able you see that the only decisions that had a role in causing this failure 
once you know this clause, once you know this clause here, this says substantially that after, okay, this clause here, okay, what does this clause say? This, uh, sorry, okay, what does this clause say? This says that once you have assigned a nine, a 10, a nine to force, a 10 to force and 11 to force, you cannot assign a one to true. You must assign it to false. So it was wrong after you have assigned this, this and this, it was wrong to assign a one to true. And this says, okay, if you assign a nine to nine, a 10 to 10, a 10 to false, and a 10 to false, you must assign a one to, to false. So this fails. Otherwise you fail. Okay. But then once you know this fact, once you know, so you have learned, once you have learned this fact and you are coming here, you have unipropagated this information over this, then you can conclude from here by doing the very same conflict analysis, you can conclude that altogether a nine, a 10, a, not a nine, not a 10, not 11, a 12 and 13 are not a set, are not compatible with the form. So you must, you should avoid to do at least one of those five guys. Okay, so this tells you that you can go back here. So no chances to further explore this down here. Right? No chance because those are the bad guys. You must kill at least one of the bad guys. Okay. And this tells you, so if you undo one of the bad guys here, then you're gonna head, go ahead, okay? Oh, actually there is a tiny mistake here. Of course, there is not a 13 here. Okay. I forgot, there is a not a 13 here. Okay, you see this? You only propagate after you undo on this glow, uh, after you do, you, you can undo this. So this was the original strategy. And it was a major breakthrough. Because can you imagine how much search you can avoid in this way? If you identify exactly what is your wrong decision. Well, imagine that here you have said uh, potentially hundreds of thousands or millions of decisions and a huge possible search, okay? This was really a major breakthrough. Orders of orders magnitude faster. So I remember when this tool exited, it was name was Grasp, but you, nobody could believe that. So it was able to solve problems in epsilon seconds, problem which could not be solved in weeks before, okay? So this was an impressive breakthrough. Okay, so far. Now we can do better than this. I remember I told you, well, let's first see the, the original idea of a jumping and learning, and let's see the current one. The first difference is that we use first UIP strategy rather than decision. Okay, back jumping. The second difference is that you use a different idea of back jumping. So the idea is backtrack to the highest branching point such that the stack contains all but one literal in the conflict set. And then unipropagate the unassigned literal on the conflict clause. This substantially 
obeys, as I will show you in the, in the next slide, but anticipate, to the very clear intuition, meaning. Learn, okay, do the conflict analysis. Learn the, the clause. And then go back to the oldest place where you would have done something different, that is unit propagating the UIP, if only you had known this clause in advance. Oh, if only I had known this clause, when I took that decision, I should have instead unit propagated that value instead of taking this decision. Okay? Oh, oh if only I had known that. Okay? That's the idea. Okay. <clears throat> Let's see what happens here. We are in the very same situation as before. Okay. But now we use first UAP here. So we use this conflict here. Well, go back to the slide where we computed the, the, the first UAP and learn this clause here. First UAP means uh, the conflict is not A10, A4, not A11. Okay. This cut. So the clause is A10 or A11 or not A4. Okay. What is the idea? Jump to the highest possible place where which, co which contains only two out, all but one literals. Well, of course, the, the but one will be the UAP because this is the most recent assigned literal. Okay. So jump, what is in this stack? The oldest place where you can jump, which contains all but one of the unassigned literals. Can anybody see this? Jump to the oldest place where all but one of those literals are contained. A10. Come on, guys. Mm -hmm. Sorry? A10. Well, mm -hmm. immediately after A11. Look, after I have assigned A9, which is irrelevant, A10 and A11, I have assigned those two guys. So this means that this is false. So this would be unit propagated. If only I had known that clause from the beginning, immediately after having assigned an a, not a 10 and not a 11, I would have done something different, which is unipropagating not a four, right? Say, look, you cannot have a four to true because otherwise you call this failure here. Do you see? If only this is a consequence of this formula, right? This entail of this formula. We have seen this, right? You have seen a, a deduction by you, a, a resolution deduction of this formula. Okay. But then when you have this, you would have, if only I had known this, I would have applied not a four here, right? So, in some sense, uh, the idea is that you find the first uh, UIP and then uh, you go back uh, so that you can unit propagate it as soon as possible thanks to the new learned clause. As high right? as possible, yes. The point, okay, the reason for that is okay, first, uh, there are two different aspects here. <clears throat> first is the idea jump back to the highest point where you have done something different if only i had known that okay why first you appear rather than a1 well there are reasons for doing that but so why you can do that well substantially here you pretend you have decided a4 rather than a1 we have already seen that 
a UAP is such that if you had decided A4 rather than A1 here, you would have caused a failure on the very same clause. Okay? Look, if I had decided A1 here, regardless, uh, if, if the decision on A4 were not due by unit preparation, but just by a mere decision, I would have you know, preparated A5 and 6 and failed on the very same, the same clause. Okay? So I pretend I had caused, so the, the main conflict was caused by, not by a one, but a more recent one, okay? So doing that, I'm able to jump much higher. So the procedure backside to the most recent decision level of the variables in conflict clause, which are not the UAP. So take the most recent assigned literal, <coughs> which is not the UAP, so the second most recent assigned literal, and you, you branch exactly at that level, which is A11. Okay. You backtrack to A11 to this point, so after the sign, and then of course you will have to unipropagate A4, not A4, right? Because after A10 and A11, not A10 and not A11 are assigned, then you are forced to assign that not A14 based on this clause. Okay. So what happens is actually this. Sorry. Okay. Do you see? You jump up here and then you unipropagate A4. You see this? So why UAP? The intuition. And UAP is a single reason implying the conflict at the current level. So if you substitute the first UAP to the last UAP, you would have obtained the same failure. Okay. So you pretend that you have failed due to, uh, you have decided the, the, the UAP, the first UAP rather than the last UAP. Okay, you have obtained the same effect. What, what is the advantage of doing this? Well, first, it doesn't hurt, okay? The second is it's faster to decide, right? Because if you see the, the deduction you have done, the resolution deduction you have done is much, is smaller because you have to undo less steps, right? You have to undo less steps, okay? But what is also important is that it typically requires involving less decision literals from other levels. Look here. This, involve, this level here involves not A11, not A10 from other levels. Okay. This one involves not only not A10 and not A11, but going back, it has involved also A9. Okay, so substantially, the, if you do the last UAP rather than the, the so the first UAP, uh, it it, the second most recent, so you drop, you drop other literals, literal from other decision levels from uh, the, the conflict clause, okay? For instance, A9 is not part of that. And you may have chances that that the clause at 11 allows you to jump higher, right? Because pretend that A9 was assigned after A11. Well, this is not the case in this example, but if A9 was assigned after A11, then you could allows you to jump to A11 rather than to A9. Okay. So it reduces the number of dependencies. Remember, you jump to the second most recent assigned, second most recent assigned literal, A11. But if you are able to drop, but it, we don't really know, so this graph does not really know in which order those yellow state, yellow literal has been assigned, okay? So if a nine had been 
assigned after A11. This is not the case in this graph, but you can easily pretend it. Okay. Then with the, the first UAP, you jump up to A11. If you had the last UAP, we had we would have jumped to jump lower to A9. Okay. So, okay, so in general, basically, the smaller the close we learn, the better, because uh, smaller closes, in some sense, have more information yes. than what we have to choose. Smaller, uh, yes. Uh, yeah. yes, just a and clarification. Smaller here does not mean the number, only the number of elements, but also means the Apart from the UAP, they, if uh, I'm able to deduce a clause whose remaining literals are a strict subset of those of those in the, in the last UAP. Apart from the UAP, okay, the remaining part of the conflict set is a subset of those uh, on the last UAP. Okay. Yes, basically this is because uh, when we do the learning of the conflict clause, we are applying the reduction rules, which can only enlarge the yeah, so number of clauses. If we go ahead of... here in the resolution, so if you don't stop here and go ahead, we may progressively include in this process. So those are 8, 10, and 11 here are already included, okay? The more you advance in the, in the resolution step uh, the more other the more literal you could add and the more literal you could add they they may force you to jump uh, less okay okay yes that is exactly what i meant if you have a small close then you have better chances to jump higher and of course the more you go on the search the bigger the close you're learning becomes yes. Where's the, more, sorry, not in the search, in the learning of the conflict clause. Okay. Okay. Yes, provided by base small, you don't mean size, you mean a sub strict subset. So, so the more literal you are able, the more other literal you are able to drop from the, the conf final conflict clause, the highest are the chances that you jump higher. Okay. Exactly. exactly. Clear? Yeah, yes. Okay, cool, very cool. Okay, so that's that's by jumping. You see, you jump much, much, much higher. So this is modern. So we have seen all the basic idea of the jumping, modern idea of the jumping. But in both sense, it's a huge advance, a huge advance in uh, in search. Orders, orders, orders magnitude faster. Okay. Uh, okay. So in general, you jump higher, and you. So the idea is that you allow to assign the negation of the p as high as possible in the search tree. Okay. So in general, the the higher. The smallest decision level that you are able to assign a given literal, the more informative it is, okay? Because it depends on less literals, okay? So a state in which, uh, which are identical, apart from the fact that one literal is assigned at a higher level than any other, is in some way more advanced in the search than the other, right? Because that literal depends on less other literals. So it, it proves more for the search. Okay, just a quick question about, I terminate speaking about learning. What is the role of learning here? Well, learning has two roles. First is to drive by jumping, as we see, right? But also has learning also, uh, it is able also to prune future search, right? And the reason is that when you a conflict set C is revealed, then the 
uh, well, a conflict set eta, so then C is added to, to phi. Eh? Then the solver will no more generate an assignment containing the truth assignment, right? Well, this is uh, not C, so it's eta, they are inverted, or you just uh, invert the negations, okay? Okay, but it's more than that. It's not simply that you don't repeat the same mistake anymore, but it's more. It says, look, if you are one, whenever you are, you are a step ahead or committee of committing the same mistake, you do exactly the opposite, opposite direction. So it means if you have a conflict uh, set of K elements, and in whatever order you assign in the future k minus one of those elements, okay, then by unit propagation on the, of the conflict clause, you do the exact opposite than the, than, uh, the, the last uh, literal, okay? Which means as soon, it's not so only it prevents me to redo the same set of literals. But as soon as that all but one of those is done by unit propagation, by deterministic stack, it immediately tells me, look, you have to go the opposite direction. So it means not only prevents you to go to, to a bad state, but as soon as you are one step ahead to go to the other state, it tells me to go to the opposite direction. Okay? So just so suppose you here, you have learned these two clauses here, and in the future, sometime with a completely different, so you have learned these two clauses uh, um, due to these two branches, okay? And in the future, you have assigned not A11, not A10 and, and A12, in a completely different, and not A9, in a completely different order, okay? then it tells me immediately not to do a1 and not to do a13 whatever and if you had assigned a13 instead and you were in the not a14 and not a11 and a12 you would have immediately tell you that not to assign a not a not a9 so to assign a9 so whatever order okay so this proves for future search. We have, be careful that we have a problem with learning. If we learn one clause at every branch we do, and in general, we may have an explanation, explore an exponential amount of branches, we may end up having learned an exponential amount of clauses. And if we, if we add an exponential amount of clauses, very quickly, the, the formula blows up in size. So if we kept all the clauses we learned, very quickly, the, form, uh, the formula will grow exponentially. So this pro our problem would no more in, po in polynomial time, in polynomial space, okay? And also it's not only the size it's not only a memory issue, but also the fact that we have uh, to keep all the data structure updated and it was cause a drastic slowdown uh, Boolean constant propagation, so unit propagation, right? So what was noticed from the early, from the early beginning, I tell you, be careful to this point because there are some people who still believe that uh, the close CDCL requires uh, uh, exponential space. No, that's not true. It requires polynomial space to do exactly to the next step I'm going to explain. What you can do is discharge learn closed provided that they are no more active. What does it mean? So all CCS solver allows you to discharge, so to drop from uh, uh, the formula the, some of the clauses that you have learned. Well, the first idea, original idea was just to discharge the, the, the bigger ones. So the, the bigger the formula, the less the, the clause, the less informative it is, right? So drop less informative clauses. So that was the original idea. 
But now it was, uh, they found it's much smarter to keep track of the activity of the relevance of the clause. In a with the technique which are very similar to uh, techniques uh, which uh, um, allows you to keep uh, some information in, your, in the cache of your machine. You know, there are cache protocols which decide what is recently used information, what can be dropped for your cache, to the cache of your memory. Okay, and they are based on the following definition. A close is active, if it's, it's occurring the, in, in the current implication graph, that is, if, the, if uh, it is not an antecedent clause of a literal in the current assignment. Uh, by a clause here, of course, I mean a learned clause, right? So, uh, obviously, the, the, you cannot drop the original clauses, okay? So a clause is active, if it's the justifications of some literal which is currently in the truth assignment. So if the, this, so if there is exists some literal in your current truth assignment, which was unipropagating on due to this clause. So it's necessary to just justify the presence of that literal in the truth assignment. Okay. So if this is the case. Okay, this was proved that you can safely discharge clauses which are no more active. So if a clause does not occur, is not the antecedent clause of, a, of a some literal which is in the current truth assignment, well, of course, a learner clause, then you can safely drop without affecting the correctness of the algorithm. But since you have at the most a linear amount of literals in the truth assignment, so this means that the, the active clause can be at, at the most a linear amount. Okay, so you need polynomial space to linear space. So you, in order to guarantee the correctness of the algorithm, you must keep only a linear amount of learner clauses. You can safely drop all of them. Well, of course, if you say you can safely drop about it, this may worsen uh, performances. So what typically happens in, in current such solver is a lazy strategy, which guarantees this property, but does some be something better. So ra rather than discharging all in a, all closer, which are not technically part of the, of the implication graph, you just keep track of the current involvement of clauses. So you give a score to every clause, and every time it occurs, um, every time a clause is used in, a, in the creation of the implication graph, every time is, sorry, is used in, um, in uh, uh, yes, every, every time it's used in conflict analysis, in creation of the implication graph, then you increase its score. And from time to time, you drop those with the lowest score. What does it mean? This is a compromise. So this satisfies this property because all active clauses are kept. And also those which are not currently part of the conflict set, but have recently used several times in conflict analysis are kept. Okay, substantially, you they are dropped only on demand. So when uh, when the system uh, when you have too many clauses, uh, uh, the system does some garbage collection and uh, drops those which are not only not active in this sense but also have not been used recently. Okay, this is very similar. If for anybody who knows that, this is very similar to the technique uh, used in cache clearance protocols. So the way you drop information from the cache when you need more cache, more memory, okay? Okay, that's uh, all. Just one remark, um, some intuition, just to sum up, by jumping, 
allows you for cleaning up to many decision level in the stack. And the intuition is that go back to the oldest decision you took where you would have done something different if only you had known the learner clause. So learn, learn the clause which tells you what you have got wrong. Okay, what you, the collection, what you got wrong. And say, okay, now so that I know it, if only I have known that, where was the most, the oldest decision I took in which I have done, I would have done something different if only I had known, see? Go back to, back jump to the, up to that level and go ahead. Uh, learning is that in future branches, when all but one literals in the conflict are assigned, the remaining literal is assigned by false by unit propagation. So the intuition is then when you are about to repeat the mistake, do the opposite of the last step. You can do. And this avoids finding the same conflict again. Just a notice, just one remark that what makes a good conflict set? Well, a good conflict set for big jumping is not the same as a good conflict set for learning. So big jumping may cause the highest big jump. So, so it's good. A good conflict set is the one which causes you the highest big jump. Learning is the one who causes you the maximum pruning. Okay. This all to say there are many, many different strategies. So these are the two main strategies. But there are many, many different strategies of how much you learn, how much you discharge, how much uh, you can combine things. Uh, you can uh, learn more than one conflict at, uh, at your branch and discharge them more aggressively. There are many, many, many variants of that. Okay? Just depends on who. I'm quite. Uh, wow. Sorry. I. It's 11.13, I, I went a little longer than I expected. Okay, so let me go quite uh, fast uh, on, uh, well, okay, I can do this in there tomorrow, okay? So is there any question? Okay, you can catch some question and uh, think about that and uh, you can ask me tomorrow, okay? Sorry, I got it longer than I expected. But you should tell me. And I even didn't get the interval, sorry. Uh, I understand, but this was a big problem. It was probably the most important lesson in all the South part. Okay, so I, I really had to conclude it to, to say. So get through that, uh, uh, see what you understand, and then possibly you may ask me tomorrow. Okay? Okay. Okay, thanks, thanks guys. Okay, thanks. Bye, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. 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 Bye.